Okay. Uh, so there's a war going on in Ukraine. Uh, refugees came to uh, the border cities. Um, refugees. Uh, there are you know service centers for refugees. They arrive. Uh, what do you think they look for first? Water, blanket, food, and Wi-Fi. What do you think they look for first? Wi-Fi. Yes, yes, Wi-Fi. Um, why is Wi-Fi so important? Because uh, Wi-Fi gives you information that allows you to, you know, look for food, blanket, water, um, internet has been uh, changing the civilization uh, in a way that no other communication method has done. So many courts around the world will repeat this language in different ways. But basically, internet gives powerless individuals, each individual, power of mass communication. What do you mean by mass communication? Ability to send information to many people at the same time. So power of mass communication, unlike telephone, unlike postage, right? Un unlike uh, postal services. Uh, we call this snail mail these days. Um, and this ability for people to connect with one another uh, has facilitated uh, political equality um, and therefore democracy because uh, without political equality, democracy will be uh, full of gaps in terms of a representation. There will be people who are less represented on politics uh, than others. And the internet uh, allows people without um, people without you know, class status, people without uh, positions in hierarchy um, to send their messages out to a lot of people. Also, economic uh, equality um, is uh, also facilitated by the internet because uh, uh, before the advertising space was uh, occupied, dominated by people who could pay uh, for the advertising. Uh, however, um, even one person can put up a video uh, that uh, that, that can be accessed by billions of people. And you don't need to pay anything for that space uh, on YouTube or any other platform. And as more people, as uh, everyone gets a chance to participate in economic activity, it also contributes to growth uh, overall. So uh, that's why the internet has been considered as a, one of the few technologies that was uh, embraced that was embraced by civil society as uh, just uh, unconditional good. Uh, it, it was all in the 90s that internet became popularized. When new technology arrives, uh, people, uh, civil society organizations always you know, have a dilemma because uh, if it's a new technology, uh, it's usually people with uh, uh, power and money who uh, get to take advantage of that uh, to exclusion of uh, others. So it usually worsens equality, both politically and economically. But internet was an exception. Internet was uh, uh, very passionately embraced, embraced by civil society. And starting 1995, you'll see um, a flourishing of uh, 
what we call digital rights organizations, uh, where their aim is to protect the internet as a space for sharing and openness, which, by the way, is uh, what uh, uh, I'm doing uh, with uh, uh, OpenNet Korea. Um, the URL there is uh, easy to remember, opennetkorea.org. And if you go in there, you will see that we are uh, opennetkorea.org. Uh, you will see uh, many activities that we do to protect the, uh, to protect the internet. And one of the um, big fights that we are in the middle of is a uh, fight for network neutrality, uh, which is a principle that has allowed uh, people to push information or share information with one another without having to worry about the economic cost of it. Um, I mean, think about it. Like before the internet, to make a one to make a you know one ten minute phone call with a person overseas, you have to pay like twenty dollars, thirty dollars for one phone call. With the internet, you can talk to like 200 people on a Zoom call for several hours, practically free. How is that made possible? I mean, who is paying for all that data delivery cost? Um, what, do, uh, do you know which video on YouTube is most viewed by people? Just throughout history? Baby Shark? Baby Shark? Baby Shark, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. 100, uh, let's see, 100 million views? No, more. Uh, 1 billion views, yes. No, it was 10 billion views. Okay. Yes, 10 billion views. Um, but as uh, the video was uh, distributed, you see, when you, when you look at uh, content, when you look at online content, a copy of that, uh, what you are really doing is you are sending a request for a copy of the content, and your request is sent to the server hosting that content, and copy of the content will actually be sent to you through, like, 30, 50, 60 routers around the world at the speed of light and will actually arrive on your device. So when the internet was first invented, or when the internet was first used, there was a discussion whether you know, making that copy should be considered a copyright infringement because technically it was a copy. But uh, thankfully, uh, the humanity decided not to treat that as copyright infringement. But um, so that video, uh, you know, 10 meg, uh, three, 3 megabyte video is actually sent to 10 billion people. Who pays for that? Uh, did Baby Shark, uh, you know, producer pay for that? Nobody did. Okay. So there is a magic in how the data delivery cost is uh, uh, shared uh, among us. And I mean, just to give you a hint, um, a simple answer to that is if everybody's paying just a little bit to connect to the internet, that money, the aggregate of the money is enough to finance all the cost of a data delivery happening between all those connections. I'll get to that later, but I'm spending a little more time on network neutrality, which is uh, um, one of the laws that protect the internet because there is a petition drive going on. And if you go to opennetkorea.org, you can uh, participate. Um, it, the, the petition there is in Korean, but if you, uh, if you look for if you look through the website, there is a, a button for English page, and you will find English petition. Uh, there are like, uh, uh, comic strips, uh, videos, a lot of fun material there that will help you understand. 
So that's one law that protects the internet. The other law that protects the internet is the intermediary liability safe harbor. The idea is that not everybody knows how to, after accessing the internet, not everybody knows how to actually send messages to other people. And there are intermediaries who set up platforms so that they can exchange messages one another very easily. One, you know, uh, good example is uh, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, also your webmail is also another platform. Um, and that uh, those are called the intermediaries. And the idea is that if you hold intermediaries for the contents that they are not aware of, then they will shut down the space that they created uh, for uh, facilitating communication among people. So they should not be held liable. They, they're, as long as they do certain things, they should not be held liable for uh, the contents online, even if they are illegal contents. I'll get to that later, because what we're going to talk about today is not really how to protect the internet when there is one, but what if there is no internet? What does that mean for international human rights law? That's what we're going to talk about today. So, how many of you are Students of law, students of uh, political science, okay, all right. So, uh, poli sci majors may have some training in law. So, these are sources of international law. The most important sources is uh, treaties, of course, uh, agreements made between state parties. Uh, second is uh, customary international law or international uh, customary law. Um, people use the term interchangeably, uh, which is uh, uh, built by different state parties. Uh, well, not state parties because they're, they're, they're not they're treaties. Uh, different states, through their practice, they form a custom that's common to the community of uh, uh, governance. And state practice has to be, uh, I mean, state practice itself does not become customary law. For instance, there is really, there's still no, I mean, this can be very academic, there is still no international customary law against the use of nuclear weapons because the fact that it was used once does, doesn't, the fact that it was used once, uh, and never since doesn't mean that there is a custom because uh, no government has uh, uh, made a commitment not to use it. And we, those commitments are called opinion use. So the state practice has to be backed up with a, a commitment by the practicing states that they are doing this, they are engaging in this practice um, as part of their commitment. Um, and one of the important state practice is not just uh, countries, nations, but also practice of uh, international organizations, which I'm going to talk about a lot today, because uh, for international human, ra human rights law or internet shutdown, um, international organizations have been instrumental in forming the foundation. Yuskoden uh, is a uh, um, some people categorize it under uh, customary uh, international law. Uh, these are what we call peremptory norms. Peremptory means uh, it applies to you mandatorily, uh, regardless whether uh, states have uh, uh, decided to adopt it, either by treaty formation or by state practice. So regardless what that country's um, status in treaty formation, or in treaty relations, or what that state's practice is internally, 
there are norms that apply to all the states regardless if they are to be considered states uh, if they are considered if they are to be considered genuine states um, when it comes to human rights law so 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 I talked about international law, now I'm going to talk about international human rights law. So when it comes to treaties, the two most important treaties are International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or ICCPR, and ICESR. Can someone guess what that is? Okay, yes. National Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Right, right, okay. All right, since you answered that question, um, do you know any country that's not, um, that is a, um, that's not a party to ICCPR? I think Singapore. Okay. Um, I think Saudi Arabia is not part of it. Okay. Um, North Korea also is not a party to uh, ICCPR. Um, does anyone know? Does anyone know a country that's not a party to ICESR? The US. Yeah. The US is not a member to ICESR. Um, so, treaties do exist, but uh, they do not, um, they bind only the uh, parties to the states. I mean, only to the state parties that uh, join those uh, treaties. That's why customary international law is important because uh, that, um, even when the state parties did not you know, specifically join, it will apply to them. And when it comes to international human rights law, Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, forms the foundation because uh, that was the first time that the term human rights was actually concocted and was uh, circulated. 1948, after World War II, people realized that the um, slogans like democracy or freedom, uh, these things all, you know, um, even uh, uh, you know, people's revolution. Uh, these things do not really stand for good because um, some of the uh, worst, some of the um, some of the cruelest uh, tragedies on uh, human lives took place through a formerly democratic process. For instance, in Germany, uh, in, in, in Nazi Germany, uh, they realized that they need uh, some other term that we can hold on to, that we can value. And they decided that it's human rights. And Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, later became the basis, the, the source of values for ICCPR uh, that we just talked about. So, by the way, um, ICCPR, uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, is what people usually refer to when they say a human rights treaty or international human rights treaty. And I talked about USCOGEN, uh, and these are kind of uh, uh, examples of USCOGEN uh, norms that scholars have uh, agreed to be um, applicable to all states, regardless of practice, regardless of their treaty positions. Prohibitions against uh, crimes against humanity, crimes, uh, uh, genocide and human trafficking. Uh, the list is a little bit longer. Uh, slavery, uh, torture, uh, these are considered. So, for instance, uh, um, even a country that is not a member of ICSPR will still be subject to uh, liability or punishment under USCOGEN if there is uh, such violation. So you can see the value of that there. 
and also uh, many uh, uh, cruelties against human lives were uh, committed even before UN was formed, even before ISPR was formed, for those crimes, USCO again, USCO then becomes an important. So let's look at I, let's let's take a look at ISPR. I think uh, it's good to just take a hard look at it and actually read the full text. Everyone should have the right to hold opinions, just hold opinions inside, without interference. That's paragraph one. Paragraph two says everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. Okay. This right shall include the freedom to seek, receive, impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers. Underline, regardless of frontiers. Okay. Because that's important for us. Because uh, when internet first came, the idea, uh, many people thought the internet was uh, kind of a, you know, alternative a venue for speech. As long as you could speak freely in other venues, being blocked from making the same speech on the internet was not considered such a big deal. But thankfully, the drafters of ICSPR had that phrase regardless of frontiers, and that phrase became the foundation for, inter uh, for an interpretation that speech should be protected both online as well as offline. I'll get to that later. Either orally, in writing, or in print in the form of art through any other media of his choice. Okay, that was so. Uh, supports uh, the interpretation that I talked about. Now, if you look at paragraph 3, it says exercise of the rights provided for in paragraph 2, that's freedom of expression, carries with special duties and responsibilities. So freedom of speech comes with responsibility. What responsibility is that? Well, it will be subject to uh, the following limitation. Um, the, it, may, it may be subject to certain restrictions that are provided by law. Okay. Law. law. Law is abstract. What, what does law mean? Right? What is law and what is not law? Uh, who makes law in your respective countries? Does president make law? Okay. Does ju do judges make law? At, at least in in this sense, no. Who makes law? People's representatives. So, uh, in a modern democracy, it is the elected representatives who makes law. So. It is in that specific meaning that it has to be provided by law, okay? uh, and are necessary for respect of rights or reputation of others, and the, for the protection of national security or or of public order or of public health or morals. Um, just to make a contrast, there is no. There is no limitation on freedom of opinion or, or, or the right to hold opinions. Okay? But there is limitation on the right to freedom of expression. So ability to hold opinions should never be restricted. Okay? But freedom to um, externalize that will be subject to certain limitation uh, as the provision talked about. Now, there are similar provisions in other regional human rights treaties in Europe and Americas. When I say Americas, I'm talking about 
North America and America. There's a um, uh, International American uh, Commission of Human Rights and International American Court of Human Rights. And there's a, a also a similar uh, human rights treaty in uh, Africa uh, as well. There's none in Asia, uh, which is a, a very big gap because there are, you know, most people. Uh, Asia is the biggest chunk uh, of the globe in terms of population. Okay, so uh, I. I said I'm going to talk about, so who will interpret ICCPR and international, orga international organization practice on energy and human rights law is important because, as I said, uh, treaties apply only to the countries that join the treaties and customary uh, international law is your best bet in trying to apply uh, human rights law to the countries that do not, that have not joined the treaties. Um, there is, of course, Yuskogen, but Yuskogen really, you know, deals with the blood and bones. It doesn't deal with the communication. Right? So that's why international organization practice is important. And these are the uh, uh, international organizations that you should be familiar. You should be uh, you should familiarize yourself with. The first is UN Human Rights Committee, uh, and then there is a very similar sounding body, UN Human Rights Council. Uh, how do they differ? Well, uh, if you ask me, International Human Rights Committee is more like a court. Court. Um, Entrusted with the job of interpreting ICCPR, um, and actually, UN Human Rights Committee is formed by ICCPR, and their job is to interpret ICCPR. UN Human Rights Council is more like a, a legislature. Um, it is uh, um, the governments that it is government representatives now. UN Human Rights Committee, um, on UN Human Rights Committee, it is uh, legal scholars and uh, judges uh, who uh, independently, who independently um, uh, interpret uh, ICSPR, but uh, people populating UN Human Rights Council are diplomats, the ones representing the national interest of uh, um, uh, countries that are members of the uh, uh, UN, UN Human Rights Council. Um, so you can see that the, so you can see the reason why I put UN Human Rights Committee at the top, because uh, uh, they are more independent, their focus is uh, more on maintenance of law. Uh, in UN, UN Human Rights Council, as diplomats, there's a lot of politics going on and, uh, at, the, at the UN Human Rights Council level. Uh, and because of uh, you know different because of different countries have uh, um, different groupings of interest, uh, particularly one country becomes a target of uh, denunciations coming from UN Human Rights Council. That's Israel, um, and many people uh, have uh, 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 doubts about the. Uh, ability of the Human Rights Council to provide peaceful resolution or peaceful resolution when it comes to human rights law because of that. Uh, however, it, it is a still a very important uh, human rights body. UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, um, he is um, a person appointed by UN Human Rights Council to go around, to travel around the world and make investigation and report on um, report on uh, freedom of expression. Not necessarily whether the countries uh, abide by ICCPR, the treaty, but just generally freedom of expression. And there's the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which is a regional court, and African Commission on Human and People's Rights. 
uh, again, regional court and Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which covers North and South America. Uh, and there's a, I told you about special report of freedom of expression, freedom of expression, so I use FOX, FOX as a short for freedom of expression. So there is a freedom of expression special repertoires for Europe, Americas, and Africa. Okay, now we come to internet shutdowns. Uh, I already told you about civilizational significance of the internet and internet shutdowns take place in uh, different types. So there's a network shutdown where the internet just goes off. Right? The first internet, well, um, we don't know whether it's first, but the first major internet shutdown took place in Egypt uh, during what we call Yas uh, Jasmine Revolution. And it is so befitting that it happened there, uh, then and there, because remember the civilizational significance of the internet. It gives powers people tools of mass communication. So it equalizes the political sphere and strengthen democracy. And the democratic revolution in Egypt uh, caught on. The government responded by what? Shutting down the internet. So that incident itself shows how important the internet is for democracy. Because uh, that's, where, that's where the rulers uh, try to stop democrati uh, democratization uh, by you know, shutting down the internet. But there are lesser, uh, less serious forms of uh, uh, network shutdown. Um, there are different terms used, but I use this term platform access bans. Uh, what is a platform? Okay. Um, Platform is uh, a forum where people can speak to one another uh, you know, without approval, right? Okay, is New York Times a platform? NYTimes.com, is that a platform? No, right? Because uh, you have to be a registered writer, right, whose uh, writing is approved by the editors, right? Only then the message propagates to other people. That's not a platform. It's a YouTube platform. Yes. yes. Twitter platform, right? So uh, we have categorized this platform um, access ban uh, as form of less serious internet shutdown because for a lot of people Facebook, Twitter, YouTube they are they form much of the internet experience for a lot of people and that they will facilitate uh, sharing of information um, above and beyond the uh, above and beyond the uh, internet, and blocking that will have a similar effect as uh, shutting down the network. Just just so you have a, a kind of a. Um, practical understanding. How is internet, I mean, how is, for instance, uh, YouTube shut down, um, say, in Turkey? This really happened. So YouTube was uh, blocked in, in Turkey. So nobody in Turkey could actually access YouTube.com. Uh, how does that happen? Well, 
uh, I, I kind of explained through the uh, uh, through my explanation of net of neutrality. Um, so there are uh, when you access a YouTube server, you send the request, and the request goes to uh, YouTube server, and when that request YouTube is sent from, for instance, from Turkey, there are uh, domain name servers that are attached to the uh, internet service providers within Turkey uh, that send those requests to YouTube server. And whenever that request comes in, they just drop it. Right? So they never receive the content back from the server. Um, I'm, I'm explaining this to you because uh, uh, internet shutdown. In internet shutdown, the people who are actually carrying out the shutdown are telecommunication companies, the ones that are, you know, selling you internet access access at home, and the ones that are selling you, uh, you know, smartphone plans. Uh, in your home countries. Um, and that's why, I mean, I think I already painted a very uh, you know, demonizing picture of internet shutdown. Probably you already know the internet is bad, internet shutdown is bad. Even so, it is uh, legally uh, difficult to um, build a system where internet shutdown is uh, ultimately impossible because uh, uh, there are private parties involved. Uh, there are private parties like telecommunication companies that are making money off of uh, controlling um, and facilitating uh, data flow through you. Now, um, now I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, the, the standard, the, the legal standard, says, um, this is called the famous three-part test. If you study international human rights law, um, I mean, you will, you will learn this one or, or, or the other. I, uh, I even forgot when, uh, when the first original manifestation of uh, this uh, tripartite test up. But it doesn't matter because uh, it, it's, it's so popular. I mean, you'll be forgiven even if you cannot cite the uh, original uh, formulation. Um, it must be provided by law, which is clear. So, the provide by law in ICSPR, that provision was expanded to mean that it, it, it should be not just law, but it should be clear law and it should be transparent law, right? So, principle of legality. And it must pursue a legitimate aim. Okay? The law should have a legitimate aim. And then it must be, um, the, the coverage of the law should be strictly necessary and least restrictive. Okay? So principle of necessary, necessity and proportionality. Necessity and proportionality. Um, so what's happening with the, uh, um, internet shutdown globally. Uh, one country that carries out internet shutdown most is India. Back in 2019, there were 213 registered internet shutdowns. 121 of them happened in India. Um, or why so many? Not all of them. Not, not all of them uh, were done to suppress, uh, you know, political movement like in Egypt. Many of them happen because there are exams in town or elections in town. The idea is that uh, in exams, students can cheat using smartphones. Um, and during elections, people become too uh, volatile and violent during elections. Uh, so it's. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's better to uh, 
the state people gatherings. So they shut down the internet because of that. But there are, there are even in India, there are many shutdowns that target um, the groups or racial groups in region and uh, to keep them in check. Um, at least in the years that we've checked, um, there was none in OECD countries. Um, most shutdowns in Asia and Africa uh, take place in Asia and Africa. Uh, but there are exceptions. Russia, Venezuela, Brazil, Turkey, uh, they all had uh, uh, their own crisis with the internet shutdown. Now, one problem with the internet shutdown uh, for uh, lawyers is that there is a lack of transparency why internet shutdowns take place. Because a lot of times they take place without formal announcements by the government. Um, the telecom, telecommunication companies, the phone companies, internet access providers, ISPs, uh, they can uh, shut down the internet uh, secretly without letting people know. Um, one such country is China, where uh, shut, internet is shut down regionally many times, and the only explanation given by the local telcos is that there is a technical problem. So there are many technical problems, shutdowns. So once the shutdowns happen for no reason, it's really difficult to uh, legally evaluate that. Because uh, if you remember the standard, uh, it has to have a let's live at aim. But if you don't know for what aim the internet was shut down, it's really hard to um, uh, uh, make human rights evaluation. Um, so there were, back in 2018, there were 91 uh, shutdowns for quote-unquote public safety reasons. Uh, but upon investigation, we found out that one-third of them was actually to limit demonstrations. And that number becomes, that proportion becomes larger in 2019. Um, half of uh, public safety shutdowns were actually to limit demonstrations. Uh, and there were 33 uh, fake news, hate speech, or well, there were 33 in the internet shutdowns to um, discourage or to stop spreading of fake news or hate speech. The idea is that you know, certain fake news and hate speech is circulated through a uh, region and it uh, it causes uh, um, uh, interracial violence in that region. So the government shuts down the internet so that internet does not become tool for spreading violence. That is the theory. That is the theory. Um, but in fact, uh, in fact, twelve of those thirty-three uh, shutdowns to stop fake news and hate speech was actually to stunt to stop political discourse. Um, and in 2018, at least uh, 33 internet shutdowns were very pernicious. They were done to uh, cover up state violence, to stop from people reporting through YouTube and etc. what the uh, uh, state is doing against its own people. Um, and then there are geographically targeted shutdowns uh, that are uh, designed to exclude and discriminate against uh, minorities, uh, especially uh, uh, the famous example is, a uh, notorious example is uh, internet shutdown practiced by Myanmar in the uh, uh, areas of uh, Rohingya minorities. So what is the standard? Um, I mean, we already talked about general standard. This standard is a general standard for all freedom of expression. Uh, when it comes to the uh, substantive standard, UN Human Rights Committee 
issued a general comment 34 uh, in paragraph 34 it says international town have to be content specific and generic bands are not allowed on sites and systems meaning if there is a illegal content if there is a hate speech if there is a fake news and you want to take that down or you want to block that it has to be specific to that content you should not touch lawful content circulate on those sites and systems uh, and since 2011 uh, that has been the uh, substantive standard and UN Human Rights Committee uh, or UN Human Rights Council uh, UN, UN Human Rights Council the, the, the legislature of the uh, UN or the human rights specific legislature of the UN have uh, repeatedly issued resolutions 2012, 2014, 2016, 2018 that what is protected offline should be also protected online. Okay, what is protected offline should be also protected online. What does it mean, right? I mean, for one, to protect offline speech same as online speech the internet should be open right so it should be kind of a uh, uh, so so some people interpret it as a uh, uh, as a absolute ban on internet shutdown but others interpret it as a ban on watertight censorship because of there is really no um, watertight prior sensors possible in offline speech because of you know people can gather in different rooms and private spaces uh, they can speak freely with one another and there is no way for the police to follow around everybody but when it comes to the internet the government can actually can actually prohibit everybody speaking from uh, speaking with one another by just shutting down the internet right uh, so that so that means online speech is uh, uh, subject to stricter right stricter restriction than uh, offline speech uh, another interpretation is that many governments around the world discriminate against the internet as a space. They think that internet is a more dangerous forum for speech than other avenue because on internet uh, information travels further, broader, and stays permanent. You know what I mean by stay, stays permanent? Once you put something on, uh, you know, people retweet, people share, so once it goes out of the uh, Pandora's box, it just never comes down. So many governments see internet as a dangerous space. And some of you in this room may think that as well. So many governments uh, have built restrictions on speech, just on online speech, not applicable to offline speech, right? So UN Human Rights Council resolution is that's the third interpretation of the resolution that you know those type of a discriminatory restriction should not exist okay um, and finally 2016 uh, human rights council uh, made uh, specific stain about st uh, specifically uh, resolved that uh, no country should uh, prevent or deserve access to information dissemination, uh, but they added this uh, uh, condition in violation of international law. Uh, so, still, um, you know, the substantive standard uh, leaves room for uh, leaves room for uh, shutting down uh, certain content. Um, and shutting down certain spaces, certain online spaces, uh, if they meet 
if they meet this uh, standard, right, standard of uh, pursuing a legitimate aim, uh, and it is uh, proven to be strictly necessary. So, uh, so how does uh, standard uh, fan out in real cases? So, in Turkey, uh, there is an Ildirim case which went up to European Court of Human Rights. Uh, a Turkish court blocked all Google Sites sites. I call Google Sites sites because back then Google Sites was a, a service where you can set up a home page uh, within Google Domain. Uh, so you can, you can set up a website within Google Sites. And some of the uh, Google Sites or some of the websites in the Google Sites um, had uh, uh, content uh, uh, inserting Ataturk, uh, who is the founder of uh, the uh, country. Um, and um, and there, there, there's a law against uh, inserting Ataturk uh, in, in Turkey. And uh, that, court that court order was uh, uh, struck down as a human rights infringing by the European Court of Human Rights, saying that uh, there are many websites on Google Sites. Uh, there are some of them that had uh, uh, defamatory material on Ataturk, but there were many uh, innocent Google Sites that were blocked together by the uh, court order. And so it had a significant collateral effect. Um, now, the government the government's uh, counter argument was that, hey, Google Sites is only one of the means of uh, communication. Um, you know, they can all badmouth at the talk if they want. You know, off uh, through through other means, they can have a meeting. Uh, all we did was just shut down Google Sites. It's just one of the services that people can use. Um, the European Court of Human Rights did, did not agree with that. Uh, they saw internet as, uh, well, not just the internet, they saw Google Sites, just one service, on one online service on the internet as uh, central to people's uh, communication among themselves. Um, the second, but uh, in contrast, there was a case, um, again, out of Turkey, Akdeniz, where court ordered blocking myspace.com, which was a music site for a copyright violation take place there. Uh, there, the uh, European Court of Human, Human Rights um, approved the court order, saying that, uh, you know, music, uh, just listening to music is, uh, uh, it doesn't really raise matters of general interest. Um, they said, uh, they made a distinction between, you know, Google Sites and uh, a music site, uh, saying that uh, much more general uh, communication can take place through Google Sites. So uh, there, uh, the Actonist Court saw MySpace.com as actually one of the means of sharing music. They didn't see. Uh, myspace.com as the central space for sharing uh, information. Uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, approved other um, blockings, other uh, blocking of websites in Telecabel and Cartier, all for uh, copyright or intellectual property uh, protection, as long as there is an appeals process, right? There is an appeals process uh, whereby innocent contents uh, could be uh, uh, could be restored. And then came the famous case of uh, Chengiz uh, in uh, European Court of Human Rights, where the court actually blocked the entire YouTube uh, for. Again, inserting Ataturk, the founder of the country. Um, there, the uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, uh, you know, clearly said uh, YouTube is uh, not just one of the means of communication, but it is one of the 
uh, central foundational uh, space for uh, sharing, sharing opinions and struck down the Turkish court order. There are other um, um, cases, but I think I'm, I ran out of time already, right? Okay, all right. So I'll just read this for you. Um, okay, well, mm, I'll just go through uh, recommendations. Um, Now, so, so internet shutdown is bad, and platform access ban is also bad if it um, um, if it's not you know if, if it goes beyond the necessary and proportionate uh, necessary and uh, proportionate scope, um, then how can we make I mean can we make a law? Uh, that um, prohibits the governments around the world, right, uh, from uh, shutting down the internet or uh, blocking uh, access bans. I mean, I mean, uh, for uh, for accessing uh, for for blocking access to certain websites. Uh, it is difficult. It is difficult because uh, the companies that are taking orders from the governments, they are usually uh, imposed what I call public interest obligations. Because uh, to uh, build internet access, they either, I mean, for wireless internet, they have to be given the uh, um, bandwidth. They have to be given the frequencies uh, given monopoly on frequencies, and also if they for wire the internet, they also have to be given right to use the space in the underground underground conduits and or space on electric poles, right? And those are our public goods. So these ISPs and telecommunication companies uh, are receiving monopoly on public goods, and in return they are put under public interest obligations, meaning that the government always has a hold on them. The government can easily issue orders to these uh, telecommunication companies. And it is that, that uh, um, ability for the uh, ability of the uh, executive branch, the access of the executive branch to the telecommunication companies, it is that space that internet shutdowns take place very easily. So uh, it, it is very d difficult to uh, make a kind of a, 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 a foolproof uh, law against the internet shutdown. But uh, we will, uh, we are still trying to uh, find a good uh, balance uh, in, in all of this. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, and I take questions uh, if there's any. Yes, uh, thank you very much for his great and insightful presentation. And he mentioned that it is it is really difficult uh, to prohibit uh, states from um, the blocking the uh, access to the internet. And then he said uh, that in the context of the companies and the close relationship between companies and states. But when it comes to North Korea, it would be more extremely difficult because the subject itself and who are going to do this, who is doing this, is the reason itself. So um, we guess how challenging it would be when it comes to North Korean human rights. And his presentation is great coverage of the micro-level sort of things uh, that uh, he talked about the international law and then narrows down to 
um, and, and where the human rights comes within this international law and then it narrows down to the more specific ones, the internet the shutdown. And so, yes, uh, it would be still hard for you to apply what you learned from this, organ from this workshop to actually do your research, but I think at least they give you a little bit of a uh, sense of a direction where your research should be going and knowing that would put you in a very different position to do research from different perspectives and this um, background knowledge. So uh, please give him a big applaud first. <laughs> so then it's a Q&A session. If you have any questions, then just please raise your hand and please. I think I can be loud enough. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Isidora. I actually have a question for you is since we are all kind of aware that so trying to search for a unicorn to create and actually respect an international law that is going to uh, strip away such great power that the governments possess over blocking and implementing um, both forum, well, platform bans and multi, well, entire network bans. Do you think that bypassing possibly any of these is uh, by using something new as we have seen um, in Ukraine, such as Starlink, and possibility of that happening currently now in Iran, because they are the most currently experiencing the, the network bans. Is that maybe playing uh, against the rules, or is that a future? Uh, that's definitely a future. Um, the uh, uh, satellite internet uh, is uh, always an option. Um, I mean, we, um, I'm also doing some work in Myanmar, and when the Myanmar coup that happened in uh, uh, February, uh, they also shut down the internet uh, to prevent people from gathering. Um, and uh, we, uh, our first thought was uh, asking us to uh, uh, provide the satellite internet there, but um, the orbits of the satellites were just too far um, the reason that Musk could do it for Ukraine was because the, uh, the satellites were, uh, the, the orbits were already passing through uh, the affected area. Um, yeah, uh, it's uh, definitely, I mean, the short answer, yes. Thank you. Anyway. Thank you for your great lecture. It was pretty um, impressive. Um, the main um, issue of North Korea, like internet in North Korea, is um, totally not allowed to access internet um, from the ordinary people that is generated by the government policy. Uh, in the report, of our common agenda report of the Secretary Gen General, UN Secretary General, published last year, they mentioned that um, they are aiming for um, the internet access for entire people by 2030 is their own their goal. So um, internet is getting more uh, into the um, everyday life outside also, the North Korea, um, we are using internet even this time, um, but North Korea, the problem is not allowed, um, not by the uh, infrastructure, it is generated by the government policy. So, um, is there any way that UN or international community can force North Korea, North Korean government, to allow access internet to its people. Uh, that's the thing. Um, the uh, I mean, there are two sides to this. If you look at the uh, international human rights documents that I reiterated, there's no statement that internet access has to be provided. Uh, there are statements that internet access should not be disrupted, 
but there is really no statement that internet access has to be provided. Um, uh, there are, uh, you know, other like uh, economic social rights um, documents that uh, emphasize uh, access to the uh, internet, but um, whether uh, you know that's whether provi whether provision of that is a, a absolute duty of the state. That's not clear. So that's one side. The other side to that is uh, it's so easy to join the internet. Um, the way the internet works is that there is a reason why internet is spelled with a capital I. Uh, these days, people use with a small I, but uh, for I mean that case. Uh, we spelled it with a capital I because there is only one internet. What I mean is uh, the internet is uh, basically the state of connectedness of uh, all these computers, um, by, uh, uh, um, complying with uh, uh, this one protocol, TCP IP. Um, and as long as uh, you have a, a terminal uh, that uh, that you know abides by that protocol and connects to even one neighboring computer, one neighboring terminal that's already online. Then you are online. Um, so uh, I mean, around the world, there's this movement called the community networks. And if, uh, for instance, uh, let's say you know, let's think about a country where internet is banned. Well, not banned, but there's just no internet. They can just connect with one another. Uh, and if there is uh, enough uh, members, uh, I say 10,000 people connected with one another through that protocol, TCPIP, then they can bargain with uh, international uh, carriers to put just one cable in there that provides uh, outlet to the uh, whole of the internet. Um, there are uh, several successful um, community networks built uh, in uh, Global South that way. Uh, but I mean, if the if the government uh, you know uh, actively like breaks down the internet, I mean that's another story. But if the government is uh, uh, just doesn't, uh, it's just, it's just failed to provide uh, internet access. Community network is one way of uh, um, uh, obtaining access to the internet without waiting for, you know, uh, the government investment or uh, telco investment. Thank you. Um, so, what could be the possible and practical way that um, asking all the you have member states or all the countries to provide internet for their people without limitation. Um, I mean, like there are a lot of movements and a lot of NGOs are working for this. But um, if that, if is, if there's any like, legal format or international common format of the providing internet freedom, could be not only for um, North Korea issues at all. It could be also for the other authorization countries as well. So is there any like, possible way you think? Well, uh, satellite internet, community network, um, and also the movement that we are doing, net neutrality, makes sure that, uh, the, I mean, there are times that telecommunication companies um, uh, fail to invest in network build out um, just to you know charge more money uh, just to earn more profit um, they will build only in the cities where they can make uh, big profit um, so it, it is uh, um, you know that's that's another kind of a legal uh, um, I guess assurance that uh, 
the money goes where it's needed. But you are more talking about you know, fighting against government restriction, right? Uh, I mean, that's, that's for another story. Um, I think that, uh, um, you know, to evade government restriction uh, on internet access, uh, you will need uh, more, you know, physical solutions like satellite internet. Uh, one reason that uh, we couldn't really rely on uh, Starlink for Myanmar was because of see Ukraine. There is a safe space where you can get the, uh, uh, um, the parabola antenna that you need because you need a big one. In Myanmar, the whole country was uh, you know under attack by the military. Uh, military junta. So uh, we realized that it would be practically impossible to equip people with uh, this uh, you know, at least like 15 inch uh, uh, parabola antenna. Hopefully technology you know, will advance and that antenna can become as small as this. Then I guess uh, it will be just a matter of uh, just you know, carrying this into the country. If you are talking about North Korea, you know, maybe sending devices like this, like you know, like sending radios, right? Maybe that uh, that day may come. In terms of, uh, uh, I know some of you uh, may be frustrated, but uh, as I said, uh, I mean. There is no world government, there is no world court uh, that has a binding force. Um, so uh, there, there is a fundamental limitation there. I was uh, wondering what your thoughts are on internet freedom here in South Korea itself, uh, as there can also be considered to be platform bans in here, such as uh, sites that are more like pro uh, North Korea or like more empathic to North Korea. Uh, as I think the only other limitation here is on adult content. I don't know if there's more limitations, uh, but also. Um, for people here to comment on certain sites, you need to be locked in um, with your like citizen membership. I was wondering if you feel these are like necessary limitations and like as they considered like threats to uh, national security, or if these can like also hinder uh, democracy in a certain sense. Uh, yes, it hinders democracy. Um, Thank you for asking because uh, um, the last uh, the last bit that you talked about uh, where people um, using internet have having to register their you know uh, real names and uh, rest on registration numbers that's called the internet real name law. Uh, the founders of the internet the founders of uh, OpenNet, uh, my organization. Uh, including me, are uh, the group that challenged the law and was successful in uh, bringing it down. Now it's no longer the law, uh, but many uh, websites choose to collect that information for their own good. Um, and uh, um, Korea is one of the uh, most restricted country in terms of uh, the number and how should I say this? Uh, creative range of uh, regulations on internet. Uh, starting with the internet real name law, there's a, there was, until recently, game shutdown law, uh, where you know, people under the age of 16 had to stop playing game when the Korean club, uh, or a club in Korea time zone hit 12 midnight, uh, even, if you, even if you are playing you know, game in London during the day there. Uh, there are uh, many other, um, there are several other uh, uh, 
restrictions that do not exist in uh, other countries. Uh, one is uh, administrative censorship. We have a uh, uh, specialized body uh, that uh, reviews and censors uh, online content. And one of the most uh, uh, censored content is uh, North, Korea, North Korea government's website. Uh, so, so like you can view those websites anywhere around the world, but not in Korea, not in South Korea. Um, North, so OpenNet was involved in uh, uh, defending access to uh, these websites, including uh, North Korea related websites. NorthKoreaTech.org is a website set up by, um, I believe this is a, a, he's a British uh, gentleman who provides information about use of digital technologies within North Korea. A lot of people think that there's nothing there, but you know, there is a uh, like, you know, uh, few millions of people using smartphones. Uh, and he just wanted to provide that information, but that was a struck, that was a blocked by um, this uh, administrative, uh, blocked by uh, South Korean government uh, for, you know, the, uh, uh, for the pretext of uh, uh, assisting uh, the enemy. Um, we filed the lawsuit and we were successful in uh, undoing the ban. So now it's uh, uh, available. Womat.life is a website, a feminist website, uh, which uses, um, I don't recommend, you know, I, I don't recommend the website to people because uh, I don't necessarily concur in their uh, strategies, but they apply a mirroring, techno a mirroring strategy, meaning that they use the same abusive language that uh, men uh, uh, use uh, against the woman, in, in chauvinistic manners. Uh, the idea is to teach to the public you know, what, what, what verbal abuses that women are taking, right? Uh, and that website, because of the uh, push from uh, you know, Korean male population, uh, there was a criminal investigation on uh, Walmart website and we defended the uh, uh, website operator from the criminal investigation to make sure that it's not blocked. Women on Web is a website that provides a medical abortion, meaning abortion by medication, um, through a remote, I mean, it, it is very useful for women uh, with a low income uh, or with no ready access to uh, health care or uh, abortion service providers, or in countries where abortion is banned, uh, in Catholic countries. Um, and we are in, we are uh, uh, in the middle of a lawsuit to uh, undo the uh, access ban placed by South Korean government. Um, of course, uh, this doesn't mean that you know Korea, Korean people are in any way, uh, you know, oppressed to uh, become uh, powerless uh, and to lose chance for democracy. Uh, people are fighting, and OpenNet is one of the you know one of the peoples fighting back on those restrictions.